Welcome to our third lecture on utilitarianism. This lecture will focus on the utilitarian philosophy of John Stuart Mill. John Stuart Mill's father. John Stuart Mill lived from 1806 to 1873. This lecture will closely follow Mill's account of his philosophy as given in his book entitled Utilitarianism. John Stuart Mill's father was friends with Jeremy Bentham, and Mill was brought up by his father to be a utilitarian, with the hope that he would continue to develop and promote that philosophy. Mill did continue to promote utilitarianism, though he also found some important disagreements with utilitarianism as his father and Bentham had presented it. His most famous objection to the utilitarianism of Bentham came in his distinction between higher and lower pleasures. We remember from our lecture and reading on Bentham that he believed that a simple, time-wasting game such as pushpin was just as valuable for humans as pursuing high arts such as poetry. Bentham believed that pushpin might even be a better pursuit because everyone can enjoy playing a simple game, and for Bentham there is no distinction between intellectual and simple pleasures. What Bentham cares about is maximizing pleasure in terms of duration, extent, intensity, fecundity, probability, etc. The value of a pleasure is based on how much can be produced in the world and on how well you are av avoiding the causing of pain when achieving that pleasure. A Restatement of the Principle of Utility Mill begins Chapter 2 of his book Utilitarianism with a restatement and endorsement of the principle of utility. He agrees with Bentham that, quote, actions are right in proportion as they tend to promote happiness, wrong as they tend to produce the reverse of happiness. Why many reject the principle of utility. After affirming the principle of utility, Mill goes on to discuss an objection to that principle and to utilitarianism generally that had by this time become quite a common objection. The objection is this. Isn't utilitarianism, with its focus on the doctrine of pleasure, a theory that is disgraceful to human dignity? Would not pursuing pleasure and the avoidance of pain in the world encourage all of us to live like animals? Wouldn't we want to live like pigs, getting all the food, sex, and simple pleasure we can attain? And if that is the life that utilitarianism would promote, then utilitarianism itself is a bad ethical theory and is offensive to human dignity. Someone living for true human pleasure would not live like a pig. John Stuart Mill brings up Epicurus here to contextualize his objection to hedonistic theories. You remember that hedonism is the view that promoting pleasure is the only good and that causing pain is the only bad. Epicurus agreed with this claim, but Epicurus was not a utilitarian. That is because Epicurus was an egoistic hedonist. That means he believed that the good life was a matter of getting my own pleasure and avoiding my own pain. Unlike the utilitarians, who believe that the good life is a matter of maximizing pleasure and minimizing pain for everyone. Epicurus lived in ancient Greece not long after the time of Aristotle. Epicurus started a commune outside the city of Athens, Aristotle's hometown. He encouraged everyone in his commune to seek pleasure together inside his garden estate. Rumors circled about Epicurus 
and his pleasure compound. Stories emerged that the people living with Epicurus engaged in drunken orgies, unlimited sex, wine, and gorgy non-food. Imagine how surprised people were when they actually visited Epicurus's compound and found that Epicurus was teaching something very different. Yes, he was teaching people to live for their own pleasure and the avoidance of pain. But in order to do this, he actually recommended moderation in food and drink, as well as abstaining from sex. He recommended eating simple food, such as the vegetables he grew in his own garden, and his followers spent their time reading and discussing philosophy rather than in drunken orgies. How did this practice result from a theory which told everyone to live for pleasure? After studying Aristotle, you can probably imagine his answer. Epicurus believed that eating fine and fancy food would just cause you pain when you could not get that food, and it would make ordinary food no longer pleasurable for you. Indulging in wine and sex would lead to physical as well as emotional pain that Epicurus thought was best avoided. The pleasures of philosophy and friendship were consistent and reliable, and so Epicurus taught his disciples to rely on those. It is no surprise that Mill locates the controversy of utilitarianism next to the controversy of Epicureanism that had occurred 2,000 years earlier. Both were being accused of encouraging people to indulge like animals in simple pleasure, but Mill believes that a utilitarian would be like an Epicurean and not encourage a lifestyle of animalistic pleasure. Mill does, however, blame the earlier utilitarians, such as Bentham, for the fact that utilitarianism is accused of encouraging people to live like animals. Bentham, as we know, explicitly stated that the quantity of pleasure is all that matters, how much pleasure we get and how much pain we avoid. Mill wants to advocate for utilitarianism that encourages us to maximize not just the quantity of our pleasures, how much do we get, but also the quality of our pleasures. Some pleasures have more value, dignity, and worth than others. What characteristics do higher quality pleasures have? Mill is somewhat vague on just what higher pleasures look like, as opposed to lower quality pleasures. In Chapter 2 of Utilitarianism, he points out that a theory of the kind espoused by Epicurus would focus on, quote, pleasures of the intellect, of the feelings and imagination, and of the moral sentiments. A much higher value for these pleasures than for those of mere sensation." Unquote. So we can infer from this that Mill, unlike Bentham, would put the pleasure of good poetry before that of a simple game like pushpin. Good poetry can develop our minds and imaginations. It can activate our moral sentiments and make us feel for other people and want to become better people ourselves. According to Mill, the pleasure of being engaged in the world in that sort of meaningful and human way is more rewarding than the simple animal pleasures, even if the animal pleasures might be enjoyable as well and might occur in high quantity. The Human and the Pig One way that Mill makes his point is with this theoretical scenario. Imagine you were to be given the choice of living a life as a human, with uniquely human pleasures, but also the pains that come with being human, or living the life of a well-kept pig. Humans have the joys of meaningful relationships, a thoughtful engagement with life, and experiencing life in all of its complexity and contradictions. But humans also suffer from fears and sorrows that a pig does not. A pig never asks, presumably, am I a good pig? 
Do people like me? Does my life have meaning? A pig does not cry when it fails to meet its goals or feels unloved. But Mill claims we would not choose to become pigs if we could do so. Even if the life of a pig had a lot of guaranteed simple pleasures, mud, slop, sex, a warm bed, etc., and very little pain, we value the human pleasures too much to ever want the life of a pig. According to Mill, if we did want the life of a pig, it would only be because the suffering in our lives was so unbearable that we would want to stop it by any means, even though we knew the pleasures of the human were more valuable than those of the pig. Socrates and the Fool Mill makes a similar point by comparing the life of Socrates and the Fool. Socrates, the teacher of Plato, who was Aristotle's teacher as well, famously lived a life of great uncertainty. He questioned everything and spent his life in philosophical pursuit of wisdom, but was never sure about any of his beliefs because he was willing to question them all. The people of Athens were so disturbed by Socrates and his questioning of all authority that they had him put to death to protect the Athenian state. Would the life of a simple fool be more pleasurable than the uncertain life of Socrates? Mill would claim, no. His claim is that living an engaged and thoughtful life with close and committed friends was a greater pleasure than living the life of a simple fool. So much more valuable are those pleasures. We would choose the life of Socrates if we could experience it, even though it may have contained additional suffering that the life of the fool might avoid. The value of those higher pleasures would outweigh the additional suffering in Socrates' life, as well as the additional simple pleasures the fool might experience. How do we decide which pleasures are higher pleasures and which are lower pleasures? We have seen something about what the higher pleasures look like according to Mill. But how do we decide what counts as a higher pleasure? Obviously, the only way to really tell is to experience it. Mill claims that those who have truly experienced both higher and lower pleasures will experience the higher pleasure as more valuable and will know it is more valuable. What is more pleasurable? A passionate and explosive one-night stand where two people seek complete animal gratification or a committed enduring relationship where two people seek the benefit of each other and try to help each other become the best people they can be. Mill would claim that those who have experienced the higher forms of love will experience them as inherently more valuable and will be aware just from the experience of both that the one is better than the other. The obvious objections to Mill's theory that we can easily identify the higher value of higher pleasures over lower pleasures is this. Why do people choose the lower pleasure if we know, just from the experience of both, that the one is more rewarding and in some sense more pleasurable than the other? Why do people in loving, committed relationships have meaningless one-night stands? Why does someone who has been sober for years leave their family and a meaningful career and choose to be lost in drugs instead. Mill has three answers to give to this. His first answer might be simply that the person in question never actually experienced the higher pleasure. Perhaps the person choosing a series of one-night stands and meaningless sex has never actually experienced the higher pleasure of a relationship of mutual support, encouragement, and ethical pursuit. If so, we would expect that person to pursue only the pleasures of which they were aware. The second answer Mill gives is that sometimes we know that one pleasure is better, but the power of the lower pleasure overwhelms our ability to choose wisely. We might put the drug addict in this category. We might not expect the drug addict to say, the pleasure of drugs is more valuable than the pleasure of my family and career. We would expect instead that they might say, I know 
my family is more valuable, but I was overwhelmed by my desire for the drug. Mill's final answer as to why people sometimes choose lower pleasures after experiencing both higher and lower is just that people might lose the ability to experience the higher pleasure. He points especially to the sad process of people becoming jaded in response to age and experience. In this case, someone might leave a meaningful relationship because they had become incapable of feeling the lofty love they once felt or a drug addict might go back to his drug because the idealistic pleasure of a career pursuing a cure for cancer or a diplomatic peace could no longer be experienced. Mill blames both the individual person and society for this loss. Society puts us in careers and situations where our quote, nobler sentiments are not valued or promoted, and individuals might not nurture their appreciation for higher things and thereby lose the ability to experience them. Throughout his career, Mill advocated for both societal structures and individual values that keep our appreciation of the higher and more noble pleasures alive.